Hello guys and welcome back to another episode. Today we are going to be looking at Valley from Triacme. It's a box that was released about one and a half to two hours ago. I've managed to finish it and it was really an amazing box though it had a lot of steps between uh, initial photo and getting root on the box. So uh, I was number seven as you can see and I'm going to take you through the exact process that I used uh, from getting initial photo to getting root of the box. So without much say, let's jump in. So the first thing that I need to have is the IP address of the box. I have restarted the box, so my IP address is going to be looking different. But the thing that I'm going to be doing is first of all pinging the box. So to ping the box, I'm using the command ping. Then I specify dash count one to just do one echo request. Then specify the IP address of the box. As you can see, it doesn't work. And the reason as to why this is the case is because I haven't started the VPN. So let me start the VPN. Then we can actually ping the box. So slash slash config. Then I specify my open VPN key. So lastly, I have to specify my password. Uh, sorry about that. So there it is. So the next thing, let's try again to ping the box to make sure that it's actually alive before we can start doing the name map scan. And as you can see, uh, it's alive. So this time we get a TTL of 63, which indicates that we're actually working with a Linux box. And you can see we sent an echo request and we received an echo reply. So basically it works. So the next thing that you're going to do is to run an nmap scan on the box. And I've already run the top 1000 ports so that, you know, it doesn't take much time. So let's just uh, look at the results that I've stored in nmap. So here it is. So to run an nmap scan, uh, the command that you're going to use is nmap-sc for uh, default scripts dash sv to enumerate version or a to output all format in a directory called nmap then you're supposed to specify the ip address of the box so as you can see we have two ports that are open uh the uh, the first port is ssh running on port 22 and you can see it has an uh, version of open ssh version 8.2 p1 i'm not exactly sure if it has a vulnerability as we speak right now but it's something you can actually search to see if there's any vulnerability so the second port is http it's running on port 8 and it's using Apache HTTPD version 2.4.41. So first of all, we've been able to enumerate uh, some things about the box. Like one of them, we know that it's running a Linux operating system, which is uh, a new band variant. So basically, that's one of the uh, first things that we've identified. But right now, as we speak, we can only start by enumerating port 80 because we don't have credentials or usernames to start performing some attacks on port 22. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to go to my browser, just try to trying to access uh, the web page to see exactly what you're going to get. We get some uh, a website for a company that appears to be capturing memories or you know taking photographs, something like that. And you can see the copyright is 2001. So basically, I'm not exactly sure if this means that this site hasn't been updated since 2001. But it's something that you'd like to keep at the back of your mind because as you progress through the box you'll notice that some of the architecture that is being used is actually outdated like uh, later on we'll come to discover that there is some bit of plan that the authentication that is happening on the web application so the next thing that i'm going to do is to just take uh, the ip address of the box then uh, what you're going to do is to run a uh, directory brute forcing so to do that uh, what i'm going to do is to specify ferox buster I'm going to use Ferox Buster for today. Then I'm supposed to specify dash URL, give the URL for the box, dash W to specify a word list. Let me specify a word list from cyclist. So uh, this, uh, desktop, git cyclist, discovery web content, then specify raft dash small dash words to txt. Then let it run. So it says uh, argument not found, expected argument HTTP. So let's see if I've specified the URL correctly. So just give me a second. So to specify a URL, it's dash dash URL. So that's where the problem is. So let me specify dash dash URL. Then again, try to run uh, Ferox Buster. So as you can see, it has actually started. 
Then while this one is running, remember we only run a scan for the top 1000 ports. So what I'm going to do is to take the same IP address of this specific box and instead of running a scan on only the top 1000 ports, we're actually going to be running a scan on all 65,535 TCP ports. So to do that, I'm going to specify uh, the command nmap, then specify dash p dash to tell nmap that it, I want it to run a full port, a full TCP port scan. So after that, I'm supposed to specify the IP address of the box. Then lastly, I'm going to specify a command called dash dash min, then dash read. Then I'm going to specify a value of 1000. So basically what this does is it tells Nmap that I want it to send a thousand packets per second. But remember, these might actually bring uh, a lot of false uh, negatives or even positives whenever you're trying to run a scan like this. So I recommend probably if you're actually doing some sort of a real engagement, you know, this is just a CTF. If you decide to do this flag, uh, I think you'll need to run uh, Nmap like twice or thrice just to confirm your results. Also ensure that if you put these commands, make sure that the uh, target can actually handle that specific load because it can actually act as a so sort of DDoS attack. So always ensure that you can't actually DDoS the site and also, it, you know, try to run it uh, a couple of times to ensure that you get the correct results. So let's uh, leave it running in the background and see exactly if Ferox Buster has got anything interesting. So the first thing that looks interesting, you can see if you go to sl uh, slash praising slash nodes.txt, it appears to be containing, uh, you know, some sort of a node. So it says, Jay, please stop leaving nodes randomly on the website, RP. So basically we have some sort of a username, J, then another user called RP. So it's something that we can actually, you know, given the fact that we have usernames right now, we can try to do an SSH brute forcing attack. But given the fact that I know that that's not what we're supposed to do, definitely I'm not going to be doing that. But it's something I did initially when I was actually doing this specific box. So uh, let's just leave that happening. Then the next thing that I'm going to do is to go to this directory. As you can see, uh, you know, Ferox Buster hasn't been able to identify anything interesting from the web application itself. So let's wait and see if nmap has finished because as you can see it still hasn't finished so let's just leave that uh going in the background then let me copy this link address for gallery so that you can you can actually see exactly what's on gallery so uh if i paste it we seem to be getting uh some sort of a gallery so basically it's just some sort of pictures that even appears to be static but what uh happens if we view the source, maybe you can actually get something interesting. It might be a comment on the page that can actually, you know, give us something interesting. But all we can see is these images are loaded from a directory called slash static slash one. So let's just try to go to it. We get the image. So uh, just give me a second. So we just get the JPEG image. But what if we try and see if we can actually get a directory listing? on this slash static directory. So basically it doesn't work. And you know, I'm not exactly sure how the server was configured for this to happen because as we know right now, there is a file called one, but we can't actually access it given the fact that, you know, if we do a directory listing, it says that the directory is actually empty. So what I decided to do next was to take this link, then go to, uh, go to uh, Ferox Buster, then just add it again and try to do the same scan to see if you're actually going to get anything interesting. So let me just copy it there, go back, then let it run in the background. So uh, let me see if I have the correct IP address. Cannot connect, connection refused. Okay, let me see if I've taken down uh, the site so it actually works. Okay, so I can see that I haven't added the slash HTTP. So let's do that. Then try to run Ferox Buster once again and see if you're going to get anything interesting. So we get this message saying that the directory is listable. Therefore, we don't need to, uh, you know, run any directory brute forcing. But, you know, what we can do is try to use a different tool to see if we're actually going to get another results because we know the directory is listable, but we can't see every file. So if you run... Uh, Go buster then specify dash dir to specify directory mode. 
then dash u for url specify the word list then uh, dash t for threads let's specify 20 threads then try to run it again and see if you're going to get anything interesting so i'm just going to leave that running in the background then if we come back to our nmap results you can actually see that we have another port that is open port 37370 so what i did was i took this port that we have identified right now then ran a version enumeration scan then some script scan so to do that i'm just going to specify nmap dash p to specify this new port that we've identified then dash sc then dash sv then specify the ip address of the box so let's leave that running in the background and see if you're going to get anything interesting and as you can see if we go back to our go buster scan you'll notice one thing that is interesting we have a file called dash dash slash zero zero if we go back to uh, if we go back to our gallery you'll actually see our picture starts from one and it goes up to number 18 so basically zero zero is, isn't on this specific list and that's why it actually looked so interesting to me so what i did was i took uh, this specific url then went to slash static then tried to access it so dash dash zero so we get another note that the application seems to be having it says that these are the dev notes for valley dev and it says add uh, wedding photos examples, redo the editing on uh, number four, then remove some sort of a directory, then check for SIM alerts. So basically we've been able to identify another endpoint that this my application might be having if it, has, it hasn't already been removed. So to check it, what I did was I took um, that URL, then tried to visit it. So let's just give it a second. Uh, let me minimize a bit as you can see we get some sort of a login page so uh, anytime that I get a specific login page in an application I usually test for certain parameters one of them default usernames and password you'll find that some of the sysadmins whenever they are trying to configure these specific sites or even developers you'll notice that they use weak credentials or even default like something like admin admin guest guest root 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 tor so basically those are the specific usernames that you can actually try whenever you are trying to you know uh, pen test these web pages the next thing is you can try to check for something like timing attacks remember i've seen web applications where but if you put a correct username like admin the site takes long takes longer to come back unlike when you put an incorrect username so basically with that timing different you can be able to identify if a user exists so basically it leads to username enumeration so you can even test for things like uh SQL injection, no SQL injection, Oracle injections. You can test for expert injection. So basically all those kinds of injections, something that you can actually check to ensure that it's not vulnerable. You can try to brute force the password if you have a correct usernames. But you know, in our case, even before we try to do that, what I'm going to do is to try to intercept these requests with Bubsuit to just see exactly what we are going to get. So uh, I'm just going to go to my Bubsuit, then go to proxy, then click intercept, then go back, then try a username of admin, then a password of admin. So if I click login, you'll notice that it says invalid username or password. But if I go back to Bubsuit, you'll notice that uh, the intercept is on, but I haven't been able to receive any username or password. So this might indicate the fact that probably this is supposed to be some sort of a client-side authentication, unlike server-side authentication, whereby it's checking against credentials that are stored client-side rather than you know server-side in something like a database. So to confirm this, what I did was I uh, pressed Control U on my keyboard, and you know what I was trying to do was to first of all view uh, any JavaScript file, and the dev.js actually looked interesting. So let me zoom in a bit, then we can actually look through the files. So if you read through the source code, you'll notice one thing that looks interesting, whereby it checks if the following usernames is used and the following password is used. If they exist, what the application is going to do, it's going to take you to this specific uh, uh, endpoint. So basically, we have a username and a password right now. So what I did was uh, I took the username and password then just save it to a file so that in case we'll need it later on, what we'll do is we'll, we can actually use it. So Vim, then specify threads, uh, then paste it in there. So let's just format it a bit to make it look nice. 
So there it is. We have a username of simdev, then a password of California. So let's save those creds. Then the next thing that we can try to do is to, you know, given the fact that this is client-side authentication, you don't even have to authenticate the application to, you know, access this specific endpoint because there's no so uh, there's no uh, session or even token management. So basically, we can just take this endpoint, then go back uh, to uh, our site, then just try to access it and see if you're going to get the nodes. So let's just give it a second. Uh, this seems to work. I've been able to intercept that request, but you don't need it. It says that they have nodes for FTP server. So basically, there appears to be some sort of an FTP server. Then it says stop using, using credentials, then check for any vulnerabilities, then stay up to date on patching, then change FTP port to normal port. So uh, it doesn't, it appears that there is some sort of FTP server, but you know, up to now we've not been able to identify any FTP server. Uh, then the next thing is they have said that, uh, you know, they need to stop reusing some credentials. So basically the credentials that we have gotten, uh, the same dev might be reused somewhere else in this box. So the first thing that I did was, let me just cut the creds. So there, there, there it is. So the first thing that I did was I tried to check if these credentials can actually log me in via SSH. Remember, initially we found that there was an SSH port, but we didn't have any valid uh, username or password combination to try to log in with it. So basically right now we do have valid credentials. What we can do is to try to perform an SSH login by specify SSH, then specify SIM, then dev, add, then specify the IP address of the box, it, then uh, type yes, then specify the password of California. So let's just give it a second and see if it's going to work. We get an error. Let me confirm this if my keyboard has the correct password and it does. So these credentials doesn't work for SSH and we haven't found any other login page. But remember, we had run uh, uh, an Nmap scan on port 37,370 and it comes back as FTP. So basically, you know, the, uh, the FTP server that they are talking about was on port 37,000. Uh, 370. So basically what you can do is try to log in first of all via anonymous to see if it's going to work. If it doesn't work, then we can actually try these credentials to see if we can actually get, get access to that specific uh, FTP server. So to try and log in, we're going to use a tool called LFTP. So uh, there it is, then specify anonymous, at, then specify, uh, sorry about that, let me pick the IP address of the box, which is here. Uh, then for the password, I'm just going to press enter. Then let's wait and see if we can actually log in. Uh, we get an error message saying, uh, okay, that the connection is refused. So let me confirm if we can actually access it. Let me do another ping. Uh, sorry about that. So ping. Yeah, we can actually ping it. And the reason as to why we can't access it is because the port is different as we remember. I had totally forgotten about that. So let's specify the port, which is port 37,370. Then again, try to log in. So there it is. It's trying to send commands. And we get an error message saying that the login failed. So anonymous login doesn't work. But the good thing is we already have some sort of credentials. So if I cut uh, creds.txt, we have a user of sim uh, dev, then the password of California. So let's try to log in using these credentials and see if we actually go, it's actually going to work. So let me specify the username of sim dev, then specify the password of California. There it is. Then try to do an LS. So there it is, and it works. So this password doesn't work for SSH, but lucky enough, it works for FTP. And we actually get some files. Uh, there's a file called simftp. It's a pickup file, HTTP1 and HTTP2. So the first thing was, uh, you know, try to download these files. Then from there, you know, we are going to just go through down a bit of a rabbit hole because I've seen it happen before. Uh, so uh, let's just give it a second uh, for these files to download. Then after they download, we can actually go through uh, 
one of the rabbit holes that I went through when, when I was doing the book. So that is done. So given the fact that we have to, uh, we have these specific files, the first thing that I tried to do was to see, is this FTP server linked to the HTTP? Because if it's linked to HTTP, remember the HTTP server is running uh, Apache version 2.4.1.4, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, let me check it again. So uh, the it is 2-4-4-1. Sorry about that. So the next thing was to try to see is this FTP server linked to that HTTP server? Because if that's the case, we can actually just drop a PHP web shell, then get remote code execution on the application. So, so to confirm it, what I did was I just took one of the uh, pickup files. Then what I did was I tried to see if there was a possibility of me accessing those files from the server. So if I try here, I get a uh, 404 not found. So it, it means that that file does not exist. And also in the root of the web directory, it doesn't exist. So basically, you know, the last place we can actually try is slash static, because remember, it had some hidden files. So if we go to slash static, we get that, then we can actually try uh, the same file. We still get a 404 error. So it means that probably it doesn't exist. So uh, we have these same files that are, you know, just some packet captures. You can actually try to analyze them and see if uh, we can actually uh, get anything interesting. So to, you know, uh, I won't look at all of them because I know that uh, the first two are a rabbit hole. So the file that you need to look at is sim HTTP2 pickup.ng. So to look at it, I'm going to be using a program called Wireshark. So here it is. Then the next thing that you need to do is to just specify uh, the file name that you need to analyze. And you can see we get a lot of traffic, but given the fact that the uh, pickup file said HTTP, I decided first of all to do a filter. Instead of just looking at the entire packets, I just decided to see if I can actually look at HTTP packets alone. So what I do is you specify HTTP, and just as we can see, we have really few packets of HTTP. But the, there is one packet that looked interesting because, uh, you know, there's a packet that is using the post method. Basically, post method is used whenever you, are, you want to send uh, some user input to the web server most of the time. So this is the packet that I looked at first. I just uh, right-clicked on that specific packet, then went to follow, then specified TCP stream. So as you can see through the packet, we get that there is some sort of a login happening in the first packet. So here it is. And it says that there was a username called Valley and a password called Photos1234 uh, that was used. So let me just copy it. Here it is. Uh, then we can go back to our credentials. So I then just save this specific credential. So uh, let me do Vim creds, then specify the credential. So here it is. So let's try to save it. Okay, let me do that again. And there it is. So given the fact that we have found a second pair of credentials that the application is having, what we can actually do is to try to log into uh, SSH to see if it's going to work. I'm not going to try to log in again to FTP because remember one thing, we had already uh, been able to identify that, you know, FTP we can actually log in right now. So I'm not going to go to FTP. I'm just going to focus my attention right now to try to see if those credentials can actually work for SSH. So uh, what I'm going to do is to cut the creds. So here it is. Then try again to perform a login. So I'm not sure if I used the correct name. So uh, let me just open up the pickup file again. I might have left some username you know, I might have not copied the entire username. So let me just uh, get the request one last time to confirm that the username is correct. So as you can see, uh, the username is supposed to be dev, value not just dev. So that's good. So uh, let's do another Vim. There it is.
uh, I think now we are done with Wireshark. So let me just close it up. Then uh, we can try to test these specific credentials for SSH and see if you're going to get a success. So the user is valid. Then the password is 40234. So let's just do that SSH, but we're going to specify the username of valid dev. So here it is. Then the password of photos one, two, three, four, and it works. We've been able to log into the server and we even have the user.txt flag that you can actually submit and get the points for the box. If you do a wc-c, then specify user.txt, you can get 24 characters. So basically it has worked. So uh, the next thing that we are supposed to do is probably perform uh, uh, some sort of a privilege escalation to gain root on the box. And we're actually going to be doing that. But first of all, I just needed to get some situational awareness, like to try and see, you know, what is my user ID? Because you can find that if I'm in specific groups, like let's say Docker, LXC, uh, ADM, they give you some special privileges over a box. But as you can see, I don't seem to be in any privileged uh, group right now. So that appears to be, you know, maybe a dead end. The next thing I tried to do was to see, you know, who, who are the users that are actually present on the box? Because you might be having a user that, you know, maybe you are supposed to move laterally to, then maybe probably try and exploit. So to check it, I'm just going to cut Etsy pass WD, then grab any line that ends with an SH to specify uh, some sort of uh, a binary that is used to interact with the terminal. So as you can see, we have four users. We have root. There's a user called valley. There's a user called simdev. Then there's a user called valley dev. Right now, we've been able to exploit a user called valley dev. We had the credentials for a user called simdev, but we haven't been able to exploit a user called valley and a user called root. But you already had uh, the credentials for the user Seem dev. So let's try to see if those credentials can actually work for this specific user. So here it is. So I'm just even uh, instead of typing exit, let me just see if we can actually uh, access it. Valley. So there it is. Seem valley. So okay. Sorry about that. It's supposed to be dev. So let's try, and we've been able to log in with a specify bash. You can see now I'm the user uh, sim dev. And if I do ID, you can see he doesn't have any special privileges that we can actually exploit right now on the box. So uh, it might or it might not be a dead end right now, but we have credentials for two specific users on this box that we can actually look at. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to First of all, uh, go to uh, PCNG, then download LinPy so that you can actually run it while you're trying to perform manual enumeration to see if it can be able to identify any privilege escalation vectors that you can exploit on the box. So let me just download uh, uh, LinPy from GitHub. And the reason as to why I do uh, downloads every time I'm actually uploading a box, it's because uh, it changes regularly. So the version that I was using last week might be outdated right now. That's why I usually prefer to do a weekly or even daily upgrade sometimes. So uh, you can see there was a new release that you know happened yesterday. So let me just copy the file. Uh, sorry about that. So let me just copy the link, then go back to the terminal, then try to uh, w get the file. So w get then specify uh, linpiece.sh then give it a second for read to copy the file. So we have it on our box. Then I'm just going to specify f config turn zero to get the IP address of my turn zero, uh, turn zero VPN, then set up an HTTP server, dash n HTTP dot server. So there it is. Then uh, I think I need to go back. Yes. Then just try, go to dev shm. Then try to get the file that we had already downloaded. So that's my IP address. The port is supposed to be 8000. Then specify linpiece.sh. So there it is. So let's give it a second for it to download. Then specify 
bash in p 27 a So what you're going to do is to let this run in the backend. Then uh, as it runs in the background, we're just going to do the manual enumeration on the, on the application to see if you can identify any other privilege escalation vectors that the box might actually have. So uh, let me again log into the box as we did before. So uh, let me cut the creds. So there it is. Then try to do an SSH, then specify uh, valid dash dev. Then add, then the next thing that I'm going to specify is the IP address of the box, which is supposed to be 10.10.229.130. .10 then lastly, I'll specify the password for the box. So here it is. And we've managed to log in. So uh, if I do a dot dot slash and go to home, if you look, you'll get something, a binary called Valley Authenticator. So if I do a file against this specific file, I think you'll get an, it's an ELF binary that is 64 bit and it's statically linked. It, it has no header section. So, you know, probably we need to do some sort of reverse engineering on this specific application to see exactly what it does. But even before going down that route, I just tried to execute to see if, you know, I can actually get anything interesting. It, it asks for a name. So uh, let me go back to my credentials file. Remember we had a user called validev. So let me specify that user. Then it asks for a password. Let me try uh, to specify this password. And it says wrong password it doesn't work. So probably we need to do some sort of reverse engineering. And to do that, we're actually going to do it in my box. So let me just copy the file to my box. Then we can do some sort of light reverse engineering to see if we can actually get the password if it's static on the specific application. So to copy the binary, I'm going to be using NC. Then even before doing that, let me just get again the AP address on my box. Then do an NC. Uh, then specify NVMP port 9001. Then whatever it gets, it needs to save it in uh, a file called binary. Then the next thing is I'm going to go back to the box. Uh, then I do a cut. Uh, sorry about that. Then do a cut. Then specify value authenticator. Then the output, I want to pipe it to dev. Then specify TCP then specify the IP address of my box, port 9001. So let me specify the port, which is here, then give it a second for it to copy the file to my box. There it is, it's managed to copy the file to my box. So to make sure that the two files are similar, I'm just going to be doing an MD5 sum, then specify the file. It starts with F4 and ends with 0B. Then do let me do another MD5 sum, then specify binary because it's the name that I used. It starts with F4 and ends with 0B. So basically the two uh, binaries are similar. So we can actually, you know, start doing the analysis right now. So to do the analysis, the first thing that I did was I ran strings on the, on the uh, binary to see if I can actually get anything interesting. So even before going through um, the hassle of trying to, you know, use uh, some sort of uh, a static analyzer like either Kata or Ghidra, I just decided to do strings on the application. So let's do strings binary, let it go till the end, then let's try to see if we can actually get any interesting strings that the application might have. So up to now, there's nothing interesting. So it says something about personality, but I'm not exactly sure if that's interesting. So let's continue looking at it, hoping we might find something that is interesting. And here it is, we get some sort of human readable text and it says info, this file is packed with the UPX executable packer. So basically the file is somewhat compressed and you need to find a way of extracting it. And it has told us that it was compressed or packed by a program called UPX. So the first thing that I did, I tried to see if there's UPX on my box and there's this program called UP, UPX-UCL. Uh, so if you do a help, you'll notice that, uh, let me see if I can actually get it. If you get a program that is packed, you can actually use uh, 
minus t to actually decompress whatever was packed. So let's just do that and see what we are going to get. So d then specify binary. So here it is. And it says that the file was unpacked successfully. Here it is. And if I do a file right now on binary, let's see what you're going to get. We get, uh, still it's just another elf binary, but this time we get something that le looks interesting because it even has the se section headers. So I again did the strings on the binary, and as you can see right now, we get a lot more human readable text. So instead of going through all these lines of code, I just decided to use a program called grep. As you can see, here it is. Then what I was looking for was, you know, any line that contains the word pass. So as you can see, there are two lines on this binary that has the word pass. One of them is what is your password, then wrong password or username was specified. So we have two lines in our binaries that has pass. The next thing that I did was specify dash p, then specified 10 to get 10 lines before that, then a to get 10 lines after it. So a then specify 10. As you can see, we get some words, but two, two things looks interesting. We can see that there are two strings that looks like MD5 some. So to confirm if these were MD5, what I did was I went to crack station and tried to see if there was a possibility of me being able to get the hashes. So to do that, uh, let me increase the font a bit. I think that might look better. Then try to go to crack station. So there it is. You can see uh, here is the site. So let's try to access it. So let me increase the fonts a bit. Then try to see if CrackStation can actually be able to crack these specific hashes. So let me just verify that I'm not a robot. Then there it is. So uh, the first MD5 hash is Liberty123. Then the second uh, MD5 hash is called Valley. So if we go back, remember if we go back to our, uh, uh, just give me a second. If we go back to our terminal, so let me do another cut at C past WDT to get the users on the box. Then grab any uh, line that ends with a SH. Remember there was a user called Valley. And right now we found some sort of credentials that might or might not be for a user called Valley. So let's just try these credentials and see if it's going to work. So SU dash Valley then specify the password. I think I have it on my clipboard. And there it is. We've actually been able to log in as the Valley user. But you know, it still hasn't given us root access in the system. We need to find again another way, probably to escalate our privileges from the Valley user to the root user. And to do that, what I did was I did another SU here, then specify Valley, then specify uh, the password of Liberty123. So uh, sorry about that. So let me do it again. There it is. And let's go to dev shm. Then just, uh, you know, we'll try to run, uh, um, we'll try to run, you know, link please in just a second. But let's just try to look through the output to see if you're actually going to get something interesting that was identified by Linpiece whenever, whenever it was running. So I'm just going to be fast forwarding it because I know exactly what we're supposed to be looking for. It's not a kernel exploit, but this just says that there are possibilities that these kernel exploits might, might actually work. So you might actually try them. You can see even uh, what uh, happened was uh, we were able to get some sort of credentials for an EC2 instant. You can actually try to see if they work. But you know, uh, that was a dead end. Something that looked interesting was the user root was actually ex uh, executing a photo encrypt.py that is, you know, in this directory slash photos slash scripts, then uh, photo encrypt.py. So what I tried to do first of all was to see is this file editable by our, our specific user? So what I did was I did an LSLA, then specified the file. You can see only root has the ability to read to, to write on that specific file. But what we can actually do is read it. 
So the thing that I did was I tried to read the file to see if it had anything interesting that we could exploit. The box doesn't have Vim, but it has VI. So what uh, the script does is first of all import, it imports uh, Base64. Basically, it's just a module to uh, Base64 encode and decode either strings or even files. Then the next thing it does is it creates it creates a variable called image path. Then specify a path which is photos. Then uh, you know here it specify a range. So basically it's going to be going from one to six. Then uh, you know create an image path like photos. Then p1 dot uh, jpeg. Then after that it's going to open and read the contents of that file. Then perform a base64 encode. Then lastly what it's going to do it's going to uh, create an output file, then just save the output in that specific file. So it's nothing interesting, but you know, there is a way you can actually hijack Python path if you have a right access to that specific directory where that file is hosted. So the first thing that I tried to do was, uh, you know, uh, to see if I had the ability to write to this, file, to this specific directory. Because if I had the ability, I could just write a file called uh, base64.py, then plant a reverse shell that, you know, uh, could plant a, a malicious file that could give me a reverse shell on this specific box. So to test that, I just did echo one, then specified to file called test. And it seems to be working. So sorry about that. I'm not in this specific directory, so let me go there. I was wondering exactly why it worked, but it's not supposed to work. This is a dead end if you try it. So let's again try to echo one to a file called test, and you can see we get a permission denied, so basically it doesn't work. But you know, if it could have worked, what you could have done is create a file called p64.py, then try to, uh, you know, just write a reverse shell, then from there get a shell as the user that is actually running this script who is the root user. So uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is, you know, uh, just to, first of all to, you know, run uh, uh, Linpiz as uh, the value user to see if you can actually identify other pa exploit paths that the box might have. So uh, I'll just let it run. Then from there, once it finishes, I'm going to be pausing the box, then come back once uh, this Linpiz finishes. There, then some there are some link piece managed to finish running this run, and we can actually now take a look at whatever was found. So you can see that you found some backup files. Uh, we can see we have read access on some of these backup files, but there is nothing interesting there. Then some there are some Eden files that we can actually read some of them as you can see, but still there is nothing interesting there. There are some sort of SQLite DBs that are present on the box, then some backup files. That might be interesting. These are the web files that we had initially identified, uh, but still I'm not seeing anything interesting. So if we go up, you can see that there is a portion where it says inter interesting group writable files. And it says that anyone that is in the group of value admin has right access to this specific file. Uh, so what we can do is to actually try to see, you know, uh, you know e exactly what this file can do. So remember what happens is uh, this uh, script called photoencrypt.py, what it does is it imports a module called base64. So what you can actually try to see is, you know, given the fact that it imports this module, so let me just open it up, then uh, show it to you. You can see that it does this import P64. So probably this P64 resides in this specific directory. So this is where it's actually loaded. And given the fact that we have right access, we can actually uh, try to plant uh, a reversal. And when the root user executes it, he will also execute that reversal and we can actually get root on the box. So to do this, it's actually really simple. Let me just copy the uh, absolute path. Then uh, what we are going to try to do is to actually write to that file. So to do that, uh, let me use the program called vi again, then specify the base64 uh, directory. So here it is. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to do an import. So to import uh, import OS, sorry about that. 
Uh, the problem with the Vim is that sometimes it misbehaves. Yeah, as you can see, let me use nano instead of bi. Uh, so here it is. Let me do another import. Then import OS. Then specify OS dash system. Then uh, next thing that I'm going to do is to just specify reversal. So bash dash C. Then specify bash dash I. Then specify greater than end. Then specify uh, dev TCP. Then the next thing that I'm going to specify is the IP address of my box. So here it is. Then specify a port that is going to connect to port 9000 and 1. Then specify 0 greater than end 1. So that looks nice. So uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is to just save it. It says it has written that line. Then the next thing I'm going to do is to just set up uh, listen on port 9001 to see if we can actually capture that reversal. So let me save it twice in case it gets overwritten. So this is just our reversal. So the moment he'll be executing that base 64, he will first of all execute uh, our reversal. Then after that, probably, you know, if the system is threaded, execute the base 64 uh, encode uh, function. So uh, let me now go back to see if he has actually connected. So basically this happens after every one minute. So let me just pause the box, uh, the video till uh, we get a connection back as the root user. So after about two minutes, I still haven't received uh, uh, a connection back to my box at the root user. And I thought that something was wrong. So what I did was I went to the photo vault directory. And if I do an LSLA, you can see that this file was created at uh, 2, uh, 2, 2.25 PM. So if I do a date, you can see that that is actually the specific minute where these, uh, when this file was created. So I decided to go back to look at my reversal and I noticed that, you know, I added a single quote at the beginning, but actually, you know, I didn't close that specific single quote at the end. So let's just do that, save the script again, then give it another about one minute and see if we're actually going to get a reversal this time. So I'm just going to pause the video again, let a minute elapse, then we can actually come back and see if we got a reversal. So after about a minute, as you can see, uh, the reversal came back. So it means our reversal worked successfully and we have root on the box. So if we do an LSLA, you can see we have access to the root to TXT. You can actually read it, then submit it and get the flags for the box. So I believe that's it for the video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the walkthrough and until next time, it's goodbye.